I welcome all of you to another amazing time at God City Assembly High Wycombe. Amen! Glory to God! I'm just so grateful to God for the opportunity that he has given us uh, in this last uh, Sunday of the month of May. Now, for those who may not be aware, uh, my birthday is the 1st of June. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not calling for presents. I'm demanding it. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. So it's just been an amazing time uh, throughout this month of May with the different vessels that God has used. Uh, I just am persuaded that we continue to do what it is that God has laid on our heart. Something that you don't see very often in many other churches, but we're going to be using different vessels that we can trust to continue to bring God's word to us and, and bring it from the perspective that will be colored by the different personalities, but still led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We've been looking at relationships. Relationships are concrete to everything that we do. God himself is a God of relationships. Let us make man. It is a let me make man. Let us. It's a collective. And so relationship comes from God. Relationship flows from God. We, we, we looked at it and concluded that our relationship with God is to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with everything that we have. And we concluded that our relationship with Jesus Christ, God the Son, is to believe in him, to trust him, and to obey him. And we, we were able to look at our relationship with God, the Holy Spirit. And we know that we are to fellowship with him. We are to commune with him. Everyone will know that no two relationships are the same. They are unique in themselves. So if you are wondering why our relationship with God is slightly different for the three entities that make up the God, it's because God does not do duplicates. God does not do duplicate. Every single thing God has done is unique. They may be similar, but they're never the same, not even identical twins. You know, when we were studying it and we found out that, oh, identical twins still didn't have everything the same, I was taken aback because God he doesn't do duplicates. He, everything he does is unique. Somebody was preaching about the Ten Commandments. You know that the first set of Ten Commandments that came, Moses broke it out of anger. When he came down and saw that the children of Israel were already worshiping idol, and then he went back for another one. Somebody said, No, that one wasn't quite the same as the first one he brought. But the first one was done with the finger of God. Once that's what the things about God is always unique. It's always unique. And so that like, relationships are, are also part and parcel of that. And Sister Sandra blessed us last week amazingly. How are we meant to relate to others? This is the one that is really, really, really focusing on us here. The, the, the first three was looking at, you know, the God, but the, the, the one that Sister Sandra dealt with is something that affects all of us. How do we relate one, you know, one with each other, one, one to another? How do we relate? And she was able to go through the fact that it's got to be love-based. We are meant to love other people. We are meant to do everything we can to go the extra mile with them. And, uh, and that's something that God is working on on all of us. Amen? Now, we're taking it just a tiny step further. How do you deal or relate with difficult people? Uh, because we can sugarcoat it for as long as we want. There are a lot of difficult people out there. You know, I would like to thank God that it's not in here. Amen? Amen. That's a statement of faith. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Only God knows the absolute truth. But there are lots of difficult people in this world. Um, in the last four years or thereabouts, the Lord has led me to preach this topic over and over again. For those who have been listening to us, I've called it awkward people before. 
you know, I've got all different names, but it's the same thing. So this year, when I was waiting on him, and I said, Lord, what, what are you going to preach throughout the year? Because that is what I've, I've done for many years now. Uh, by December slash January, I see, I just ask him, Lord, what, what am I doing? And he gives me the download for the year. And so when he gave us the download, and I saw this difficult thing there again, I said, ah, Lord, I have preached it. Even on my, um, on my library, I've got like all the versions of the ones I've preached over time. So I'm like, I don't know what to say again. I've said everything I, you've, you've, you've told me to say. And he said, it's because it's a class that took you a while to graduate from. So I need you to help other people there. Amen. Amen. So that was when I realized I had graduated from it. Eh? So I graduated from this thing. Congratulations. Uh, congratulations now. People now. Come on, come on, me now. <laughs> on a personal testimony in front, this was something I struggled with a great deal. I could not understand why I had to have anything to do with difficult people. People who have gone out of their way to be deliberately awkward to me. Ill treat me, sometimes they even injure me physically and emotionally. Well, why should I have anything to do with such people? So it was something that I, I just couldn't wrap my head against. Um, uh, I was one of those people that believed in instant judgment. You get what I mean? From a dirty slap to a very terrible kick, you know, instant things had to be done, you know, action and reaction. So when there was Exploring this was a tough one for me. So I hope that it blesses you. It's a very simple message. I'm not saying no, I'm reinventing anything, but it's the only spirit that's illuminating this topic in our hearts and minds. And it serves a purpose for our situation. Amen. So my product says, out of all the relationships, this is the most difficult to navigate. And we will need lots of wisdom to deal with it. With this. Amen. Amen. It is because one, one thing I'm trying not to do is to trivialize it like I've often seen people do around me. You know, they more or less almost turn the abuser into a hero or, or, or somebody, do you understand? But somebody who is guilty of this, it's almost like they're idolizing them. I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Is this Stockholm syndrome or what is it, what is it called? You know what I mean? Like, Somebody's done something bad. Call a spade a spade. But I don't know. It's because he went around the mountain and jumped two times. This is why he has come to slap me. I'm like, for real? You know? Anyway, let's call a spade a spade. There are awkward people out there. There are people who are particularly difficult to deal with. And let us start from the scriptures. Sorry, it's tiny for me, so I'm trying to amplify it as many as best as I can. Let us start from ungrateful relatives. And we're going to look at it from the Bible. And we're looking at it from the book of Genesis chapter 13, verses 7 to 9. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Pesachites then dwelt in the land. So Abraham said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, and between my earthmen and your earthmen, for we are brethren. It's not the old land before you. Please separate from me. If you take left, I will go to the right, or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. A little bit of background for those who may not be too familiar with this story. If uh, Lot was, what was Lot's relationship to Abraham? Somebody remind me again. Nephew, God calls you and your nephew decides to tag along. Tag along, nephew. This is Lot, yeah? And there's nothing wrong with tagging along. When you tag along with greatness, you'll be great too. So I'm not, I'm not saying it in a disparaging way, but I'm saying it in an emphatic manner for us to understand where I'm going with this. You were not your own God. God called Abraham you decide to go along with him. Common sense should let you know that that is the person you defer to. Listen, in everything that God does, there are clear lines of leadership and edge. 
because God is a God of order. When we were talking about marriage yesterday at that seminar, that's why he has made man the head, because he cannot leave two people in charge. Like one of my previous pastors used to say, the only creature with two heads is a monster. <laughs> so there must be clear line of responsibility. Who is responsible here? Two people can't raise their hands up. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Somebody must be the person where the, all the box stops at their table. So when you are dealing with someone that clearly has a clear advantage over you, that's the person in charge. Because that's the person God has called. But fast forward, whatever period of time this is, now you are rich now, you now have earthmen now, and now God has increased you now. Now there's struggle between your earthman and his earthman. Something that you should have gone to sort out without even getting into it. Abraham. That's what, that's what sensible people do. You're like, what? You guys are crying the husband of my own. Are you crazy? Don't let me hear this nonsense again. And it should have been the one that should have sorted that thing out in respect, in deference to his uncle. But now, if the attention has come, uh, it's been brought to the attention of Abraham, this this cut whatever this is. And now Abraham is asking to say, oh, you choose left, I choose right. Listen, people think that insult is when you, when you hold expectations of people. Not really. Insult is when you do not grant people their deserved position according to how God has created it. So for example, somebody sits down and you just drop food in their front. You didn't have to say a word. You have just insulted them. Or somebody comes in now, somebody that's meant to be senior to me, and I do not acknowledge them. That's an insult. So the insult doesn't come when you say things. It happens more when, with, your, with your body language. Okay, here, here's your thing, take. That means you're an idiot, get out of my face. You didn't have to say it, but that's what you just acted upon. What Lord did there was an amazing insult to Abraham. They're asking you to choose, and you idiot, you went, you went ahead and chose for you. <laughs> You're supposed to say, ah, Uncle, look, don't let this thing cause trouble between us. Me, I don't want to leave you. Even if in your heart you want to leave, but you get out and try and say, let us try and resolve this matter. And if Uncle insists that we need to separate, you choose first. Simple. Ungrateful relatives, they can be very difficult and all of us can relate to that. And what makes it difficult this time around is the fact that relatives are close to us. So you can't get rid of them. So what do you do? You will always be related. You will always be connected. Let's move on. I'm going somewhere with this. So Genesis 13, 10 and 11 progresses on this story. And it says, and Lot lifted his eyes. Guys, that was where God gave us the clue or where the sin was committed. Anytime anybody lifts up their eyes and it's not unto God, you are a proud burger. This was where the Bible gave us the clue to Yes, Lord's destiny was destroyed. He lifted up his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to us. So then Lot chose for himself. That means you saw what you thought was the best of that thing and you chose it for yourself. You tag along Jack. You that they were just brought as part of the luggage. You are not choosing the best for yourself. You will be amazed how many people who are close to you disrespect us regularly and constantly. It's one of the reasons why money is at, at, at tension so. Because we are so familiar with each other, you start to disrespect each other almost subconsciously. 
And God has created every human being to have a desire for respect. So whether you speak or not, you are angry when somebody disrespects you. Whether you show it or not. Some people are even oblivious to it. This, those, are, those are the worst ones. That it is cancelling that might don't want to get explode. Ungrateful relatives, what do you do with them? We're still looking at relationships with difficult people. I just, but the Lord has just led me in this direction to show some examples through the scripture. So people don't think that uh, it's just happening now. It's been around a long time, which means God has a solution for them. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's not something that has just happened, you know. <sighs> How do you deal with treacherous relatives? I've just said ungrateful people need to do that. Ungrateful was just ingratitude. It was like a uh, weak form of something bad. Do you get what I'm saying? Like on the scale of something bad, that's the weakest side. How do you deal with treacherous relatives? Let us go to the book of Numbers, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. Let us pause here. Racism has been in existence from the beginning of the world. We didn't, didn't start with Europeans, we didn't start with white people or black people. These are Jewish people and they disrespected Moses. Miriam was Moses' sister. And Aaron was his brother. This, we are talking family here. But because Moses married an Ethiopian woman, they were not happy. They were not happy. So they said that the Bible, may, if, you, if you study the Bible, therefore, the Holy Spirit, it comes alive. It comes alive. So he said, um, for he had married, and so they said, can you see the connecting there? Lot lifted his eyes and then he chose. Miriam and Aaron did not like Moses' wife, so they said. So that means the motivation behind what they are doing has been made play. With Lot, it was pride and forgetfulness. With Miriam and Aaron, it was downright uh, anger because he married from Africa. So they said, as the Lord in this spoken only through Moses, most of my life I've experienced this. I'm around people who have no clue, but they can't keep quiet. Do you know how annoying that is? I've had to just play the fool most of the time. What they're saying, they are clueless about everything they say, but they're so eager to get their voice heard. And yet they don't know what they're talking about. It, it is annoying. It is downright annoying. If you don't know anything, keep quiet. So it's like, oh, is it only Moses God talks to? No, it's not only Moses talks to, but it's Moses he has talked. Amen? Take, that, take God to court. And the, uh, 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 has he not spoken to us also? Guys, listen to the last part there. And the Lord had it. For those who don't know, it's better for you to fall into the hand of Satan than to fall into the hand of the Lord. I'm talking about judgment now. I'm not talking about love and all the things we keep placating ourselves with. It's better for Satan to face you and try and destroy you than if God comes after you because you do not stand a chance. So that we do not travel too far, what happened to Lot? He chose Sodom and Gomorrah. And God had to use Moses, uh, Abraham, his uncle, to stick by and rescue him. But in the process, he still lost his wife. 
So his destiny was determined that moment that he crossed the line. But did you notice one thing? It wasn't Abraham that decided it. Abraham did not at any point recorded in this story that he now said, don't you know I'm your uncle? Don't you know I'm the one who brought you from our land? It was God that served the justice. Amen? Amen. In, 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 in conjunction with stupid choices made by Lot. Even Abraham was still doing his best to still go and rescue him. He was still negotiating before God for his life. That was how Abraham dealt with his ungrateful enemies. They separated, but he still didn't stop loving his nephew. <laughs> and we're, I'm building it somewhere. With Miriam and Aaron, for those who do not know the end of this story, God afflicted them with leprosy. And it was still Moses that interceded on their behalf for them to be healed. <laughs> Please stay with me. I'm going somewhere with this. this. I'm not just talking for talking sake. The Holy Spirit led me into something that was just mind blowing for me. In all of these instances, those people did not say, God, did you hear what they just said? Did you, God, kill my enemy? My enemy died, died, died. died. Can you see any of that? Yeah. The Lord had it. Not Moses told the Lord or reported them to the Lord. Do you know that brothers also betray, a brother can betray brothers? Let's go to Genesis chapter 27, verse 30. We are looking at how to be in relationship with difficult people. And the Lord is taking us through a few examples from the scriptures for us to know that it's been happening a long while. Brother betrayed brother. He says, now nah, it happened as soon as Isaac has finished blessing Jacob and Jacob has scarcely gone from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his mother, came in from his hunting. Do you know why I'm not going into the full story? Because we've had this story several times before. I just want to highlight what is important in the story is to illustrate the point that God is trying to make to us here today. For those who don't know, they were twin brothers, weren't they? Twins. And yet, the mom who gave back to both of them collided with one to cheat the other. Guys, let's call a spade a spade. Because when you read these stories, it looks, it sounds so oblivious. It sounds like a fairy tale, Shakespeare. No, this were people like you and I. A mom who gave back to a set of twins or to, 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 to twins collided with one that she liked to defraud the other one. How do you even start to uncouple it? How do you start to even deal with that? There are difficult people out there. For those who do not know the outer story ended, Jacob paid in full for his, for his fraud. And the beauty of it is that not only did he pay in full for what he did wrong, Esau was blessed massively as well. Because people forget to mention that. They felt that because Jacob cheated Esau, the story of Esau ended like that. No, Esau was still blessed massively. Now, don't get me wrong, he went on to make stupid choices and ended wrongly. But that's not because of him being defrauded. Jacob went to his uncle and his uncle cheated him. Some people call it karma. No, that existed long before the Eastern religion came. Whatever you sow, you will reap. The Bible came before Eastern religion. It's not karma. It's seed. <laughs> Whatever you sow, you will reap. 
There's no, there are difficult people in the world. That, it's not your fault. You didn't create them. They're just there. But how you relate with them can decide what will happen to you in your life and your circumstances. I'm not saying it's easy. You, remember, you saw the way I started. If this is what I struggled with the most. Because I, I can defend myself. So I used to think. So let me fight. You want to fight me? Let's fight. I want to do something to get back at you for what you've done to me. I'm human. But the Lord told me, taught me a better way. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Let's go to Genesis 29, uh, 25 to 27. After Jacob defrauded Esau and ran away, he ran into a defrauding uncle. <laughs> you wouldn't want you so. God has blessed him, but he was still going to pay for his crimes. And I will explain that later. Let's read it very quickly. It's very small, though. So it came to pass in the morning that behold, it was Leah. And he said to Leah, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, it must, it, must, it, it must not be done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill our week and we'll give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me another seven years. Let me explain that to those who don't know this story. Laban had two daughters, and Laban was Jacob's uncle. So because he had defrauded his brother Esau, he ran away for safety because Esau wanted to kill him, you know. So he ran away to his uncle Laban. And the uncle said, oh, I can see because that time the world was very small, so they used to intermarry, you know, like cousin, cousin, all of that used to happen. So he saw Rachel, one of Laban's, uh, daughters, who knows what's that? What's that relationship? Cousins, are they cousins? I don't know this English relationship. Your uncle's daughter, is that your cousin? Yeah, okay. So they were cousins, <laughs> and he sort of liked her, you know what I mean? So he said, You know what? I'll work for you seven years, but you have to pay dowry in the olden culture. Most of the olden culture, they still do it in some of it in Africa, not in now, but you have to work for it or pay for it. And since he didn't have any money. He was going to serve for it. So he served his uncle seven years to marry Rachel. So on the day of marriage, you know, they put the veil on the face of the person you want to marry. The idea is that so that when you open the veil, you are excited, oh, this is the person I, I wanted to marry, blah, 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 blah. In the morning, when he opened the veil, <laughs> it was there. Only that it's not just opening bed here. Yeah. Night and money has happened. I don't know if any adult gets what I'm saying here. Yes. It wasn't just opening bed here. Yeah. You know, deed has been done. Because he thought he was with, with, with Rachel. And then he, he looked in the face, he was near. Ah! We have crossed the bridge. What are we going to do here? The uncle said, no problem, young man. In our country, we don't give the younger one before the older one. So you are working for the younger one, but I, I'm their father. I cannot give you the young This was a fraud. So work another seven years for me to, for this second <laughs> By the time I, I, I researched it, he worked, he sat the band 21 years. 21 years, I researched it. His uncle, not a stranger. We're talking about difficult people here and how to relate with them so that God can bless our lives. For those who don't know how that story ended, after 21 years, Jacob was tired. It's like, this man is just using me here. Your, your, your family is doing well. Everything is going well for you. I've married two of your daughters. They, I, added their servants on top of it for me now. Can I just leave now? Oh, yeah. The man said, no, not yet. <laughs> and the Bible now said, because he knew he was being blessed because Jacob was in that place. Mm. Hmm. And the uncle was not stupid. Mm. It's like, this is the person, the reason why God is blessing our business enterprise here. 
I'm not going to let you go. I need to make my money here. So what did Jacob do? He did not fight with his own. He decided to introduce God into the situation. He went to his uncle and said, all your flock, they are playing, I mean, as in the sheep, they all are playing. Let the spotted ones be my salary. And the uncle who has been raising sheep like for God knows how long, it's an impossibility you're asking for. So if that is what you want, so be it. You want all the spotted ones, but the plain ones are mine. Ah, amazing deal. Let's go. What he didn't know was that Jacob was talking to the God of heaven. You are going to have to do something for me to get me out of this bondage. So he went and decorated some sticks uh, and put it in front of where the sheep was eating. And they had spots on them. And those sheep, as they're eating, they're looking at that spot. And God of heaven made sure that when they born, all their children were spotted. <laughs> Did you hear Jacob fighting the band He spoke to the God of heaven. And that was how he was able to escape. Even though after that, the, the bouncy chased after him. So don't think it was an easy getaway. He knew he had cheated this guy for 21 years. And when he left with his own things, he didn't leave with one single thing that belonged to the van. They still chased after him with his men. But when they met up, the guy said, listen, I've stopped you. I've done my bit. And I've not stolen any of your things. Just let me go. And then he finally now allowed him to go. <laughs> have, have you heard of Joseph? The Bible, do you know that Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery? You know, when, when we read these stories, we think they're just stories, you understand? Like, oh, we're just reading stories. These were people that existed. Your brothers physically sell you into slavery. If you go to Genesis 37, verse 28, it says, then Midianite traders passed by so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. For those who don't know how this story ended, Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt. Egypt, Africa, was the richest and the strongest and the most powerful nation in all of the earth. And Joseph became the prime minister of that place. Even though they intended it for evil, God turned it around for This one might shock you a little bit. King David was betrayed by his son. I'm not even going to read the scripture. It's too long. Let me explain it to you. It's too long, it's too long. I've been reading all this long. David had a son, Absalom. And Absalom went to his father and told his father, You know, you are always judging people. Judgment those days, they sit in a place like king now, that people will bring their troubles and they try and sort it. He said, You can't just be doing all of this. You will kill yourself. Let me be your deputy. Let me be your assistant. Can you imagine your son telling you that? You'll be happy. You know what I mean? Oh, please, I need all the help I can get. So he was staying in front of the tent, you know, the king's tent. Anybody coming in who ask their name, what's your name? They will tell him, he will try and say some nice things to them. Then he will whisper to their ears, oh, if, if, if only, you know, my father would give me a position, I would have been able to help you more. Can you imagine? He carried on sowing this seed into the hearts of people that were coming to see his father from all over Israel. At the end of the day, the people said, you know, we don't even want King David. It's King Absalom. The one. Let me tell you something about people. People are not loyal. You think people are going to stay with you to the end of time? Let them see a better deal. They're gone. Not everyone, thank God. But we're, we're talking many people here. 
They, they, they could not remember what King David has done. Now they want his son now that has been whispering to their ears now for more than one year. Before long, Absalom has become king. David has had to run from his throne. His son, his son, the Bible describes him as a very good looking man. I tell you, when God says somebody is, is fine, they're fine. They're not just ordinary fine. He must have been extraordinarily good looking. He must have been extraordinarily good looking. For Bible to say he was a very handsome man, that means he must have some striking looks. So he used his looks, his position as the king's son, and he influenced people and took them away from his father. Trouble has been around a long time. For those who don't know how this story ended, you can carry on and read the, the, the second Samuel from chapter 15 to chapter 18. You see the full story there. He went to war with his father. He, he, he got a prophet, I, 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 I took him, and, 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 and David had to pray to God that Ahitophel should give the wrong prophecy to his son. Can you see some supernatural things happening there? So Ahitophel, the first advice he gave Absalom was that he should be sleeping with his father's concubine in front of everybody on top of the roof. It's the Bible, guys. I'm not, I'm not reading uh, dirty books. This is the Bible. So the old man was looking and looking at the king's son sleeping with his father's that's what the prophet said he should do. <laughs> <laughs> to cut the long story short, he was going to walk with his father. His head caught a tree and he was hanging there. He could not get down from the tree. And somebody took spears and killed him. Even though the father wanted him alive. The father did not fight him. The father ran away from him. He could have, David could have squashed him. David has fought war all his life. But this is his son. We're looking at difficult relationships and how to relate with them. So we're just laying the foundation of examples from the Bible. Do you remember Jesus? That he called 12 people and one of them was a traitor. So what makes you think you can do any better than that? Jesus that came from heaven, he chose 12 people, one of them was still a traitor. Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver or shekel, whatever they call them. But what they did not know was that that's what he came to do. So sometimes your enemies, in trying to harm you, they push you to your destiny. <laughs> Amen? They don't, they don't know that's what they're doing. They want to hurt you, but in the place of trying to hurt you, they push you to where God has wanted you to be anyway. Amen. Glory to God. So what is the solution to this? How do we deal with difficult things? I want all of us to know that in all these stories I've told you, they are all different. But all was done in what? Love. Somebody say love. Love. That is the secret to dealing with difficult people. Now, when I say love, a lot of people get the mistake that uh, love means that, oh, we are holding hands and we're just singing. Me, purple, everything is fine. Let's sit down and eat. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is do not harbor any bad thing in your mind towards them as much as you can do it. I want us to know that there's a time for everything. There's a time to keep quiet. There's a time to coexist with people, even though you don't like them. There's a time to run away. There's a time to pray violently. There's a time to wait on the Lord because you don't know what to do. So when I say love them, I'm not asking you to be their best friend. I'm asking you to go and sit down with them and put yourself in arms way. I'm saying, ask the Lord that, like all these people we have just read about, not to be praying for, the, for, for something bad to happen to them. Because when people cross us, the first thing that comes to our mind is, let the lightning strike this person seven times. 
I don't know about you, I can talk about myself. Can you have an accident, please, Lord? No, wait. no, don't, don't go there. And I'll tell you why. Be angry. You have every right to be angry, unless you are pretending. Be angry, but don't sin. Be angry, but don't sin. Now, let me, let, let's go into it. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Uh, if it is clear, can we all read? One, two, go. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave the way open for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Guys, vengeance belongs to God. Don't go and try and seek vengeance or, 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 or by yourself. You might end up hurting yourself. Let God do it. Be angry, but let God be the person that will do the vengeance because it belongs to God. It's, it's, it's difficult. I'm not standing here telling you it's easy. For those who saw the beginning of this summer, years before I passed this class, it took me a long time before I got to what I'm saying to you here. If I'm angry with you, I'm angry with you. I don't pretend. So I'm not going to be laughing with you when I don't like you or you hurt me. I don't know how to do that. So all this love, love thing for a long time, I'm like, what is this thing bad we say? I don't get this. You either, my, you either I love you, I don't love you. I, I, I don't know in between. But guys, there is a great place. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> because human beings are crazy. <laughs> human beings are crazy. <laughs> this is my, my grandmother's most favorite part of the Bible. She was an illiterate, but she read the local Bible in our indigenous tongue. And she was the one that led all of us to seven day Adventists. Uh, Proverbs 25, verses 21 to 22. This was my grandmother's favorite verse in the Bible. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire upon his head and the Lord will reward you, amen? As funny as that may sound like, it works. When somebody hurts you and you are not actively trying to hurt them back, you give God a chance to defend you. You give God, you give God the opportunity to defend you. So the situation is different. I'm not saying one, one cap fits all, you understand? There are some places it's Dangerous. You've got to run. You know, there are some places you've got to stay. There are some places you've got to keep quiet because it's not time to talk yet. There's some places you've got to do what you need to do. But in all of it, one thing they have in common, you must never stop showing the love of God. The love of God. I'm not saying, you know, you can be giving them seven babies or eight babies when you know you still don't know whether this person is crazy or. <laughs> I'm not asking you to be doing all of that, but the love of God. I'm angry with you right now, but I'm not going to pray anything evil against you. I will keep praying for my family. I'll keep praying for my life. I'll keep praying for my situation, but I'm not going to wish any evil of you. And it's difficult, guys. Please, I'm a pastor. I'm begging you. I'm not saying this is easy. It is not. But it's something we must ask God to help us with because we all need help in this area. Especially when the people doing it are so close to us. There are people that we trust, people that, that, that betray our trust in them. Some people have been, have, their, their trust has been betrayed by their parents. I'm a teacher now, I teach kids that struggle with school, you understand? Because I believe as a pastor, I've been useful there. And I've done in the last three or four years. Come and hear stories. How awful parents are to their own children. In this country, we're not talking about any other place. In this country, maybe 20 kilometers from here, it's not far. Parents perpetrating evil against their own children. And you're saying, my God. Wow. We, we, we thank God. Amen. Amen. Now, let me explain this as we, as we close, as we come to, to the end of this message. You have heard that verse that says God is love. Now let me explain that to you in the context of what we are, what we are, what we are studying today. 
Love has two sides. Everybody say two sides. Two sides. Mercy and justice. Mercy and justice. Most of the sermons you have heard is about mercy. Many pastors and preachers, they run away from justice. And yet, you cannot remove justice from, 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 from the love of God. You cannot, you can't just speak one side and not preach the other. So what does that mean? God's mercy gave us Jesus. So Jesus gave us mercy, mercy gave us grace. So that, you know, you have an ample opportunity to repent and be okay with God. But there's another side to God, which is justice. And justice always demands judgment. So that is coming. The day of reckoning is coming. Now we are in the days of mercy. Don't let us forget the days of reckoning. For that is still coming. Let us be sure we do the best we can so that we do not fall foul of what God has told us. So that we do not fall short of what God has told us. It is God's love that demands judgment. Don't think it's always, always about mercy. No! How long can you allow this nonsense to carry on for? No, think about it. If you are God, how long will you allow this nonsense for the world to, to just continue this way? It's got to stop at some point. It's got to put a, an end to this nonsense. One day, Ukrainians were dancing. Next day, they are running from bombs. How crazy are human beings? So it is God's love that has continues to give us and show us mercy. It is God's love that will also demand judgment and justice. So how do you deal with difficult people? With God's love. With God's love and a lot of wisdom. With God's love and a lot of wisdom. Knowing really well that in the fullness of time, everybody will get what they deserve. Everybody. Look, what, it's because people don't write it down. And because sometimes maybe those people are far from us, we don't see what they're going through. Everybody always gets what they deserve in the end. The only reason we don't get it is because of Jesus. Everybody outside of the grace of Jesus, we get what we deserve. Everybody. And so I end this with this. Proverbs 25, 21 to 22. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think I, I, I posted the wrong one there. Is he told his, his disciples, let me just explain that. Jesus called his disciples and sent them to go and preach. And he told them what they should do or should not do. And he said, I'm sending you into a dangerous world. Be gentle as dove, but be wise as serpent. Many Christians have the dove, they forgot the serpent out of it. Guys, you can't be staying stupid in a place because you are a child of God. You cannot be staying stuck in one position. Use your brain. He gave us a brain for a reason. Be wise in your dealings. Be wise in your dealings. Be wise in your dealings. Oh, this one will hurt me. Stand back from them. Don't be telling them all the information about yourself. Don't be telling them your plans. Don't be, don't be broadcasting your future plans to people that don't really, they don't mean you well. Just say because what, my cousin's daughter, auntie's brother? Well, what, who cares about, the, about your relationship? What are we, they are murderers. We used, be, we used to be proud to call them your relative. Do you understand? You know, so, somebody's going to be born somewhere. It doesn't mean they're good people. Be wise in your dealings. Be wise in your dealings with people. These ones, they love me, they're always waiting for me. These are my people. This one, any small thing, I even share good news, they're, they're not even happy for me. Stand back from them. Stab them of information. That is how I've survived. Those that have constantly wished me ill, they don't even know anything about me anymore. When we see, hey, how are you doing? Before I thought that was wrong, I thought that was deceptive until I studied my Bible. I can't be fighting with everyone. I'll fight with the other. I, I can't, I can't. So, so some of them, you just want to be smart with it. How are you doing? 
How are you doing? How are you? Oh, we're, we're there. We're there. You know, you are not giving anything away. You are just generic greetings. And then everybody knows their separate words. You've got to deal with difficult people with wisdom. If they are in a position where they are hurting you, you've got to take decisions that's best for yourself. And you've got to take it with God's love in your heart. Amen. Amen. I'm going to call Ayo to come get the offering, and then I'll come back to end this, and then we'll do the communion, and then we'll end the service. Make him feel welcome. Proverbs 3, verse 9 to 10, says the following. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. And there are three words there that I want to emphasize the importance of because I think they're important. And the first word is the word honor. Do you know what it means to honor someone? It means to do something with an extra special attention or reverence. What you need to understand about offering is that it's not a donation. You donate to charity because they need it, but you honor God. Because how can you donate to something if you already own everything? Mm. Oh. Oh, <laughs> the second word I want to focus on is first fruits. Because there are too many people who think donating to God is honoring God <laughs> is the bottom of their priorities. But when you do it first, when you give God the first fruits, you're, you're saying that you trust Him with your finances, you trust Him with your future, you see Him as your priority. And the third word I want to focus on is the word then. Uh, another way of saying the word then is after this, when this is complete, therefore, when it is done. If you see the word then, it means before you move on to the next bit, you need to do the first bit. So before you start thinking about all the abundance, all the bar that will be plenty, and all the bats that will be bursting with wine, you first need to honor the Lord with your first fruits. And so if you're getting the first part wrong, then it, by, by extension, the second part may not be right. And there's one final thing that I want to focus on in verse 10, which is not just what it says, but what it doesn't say. You see, verse 10 is a promise of abundance. It's a promise that eventually you will come out on top. But what it is not is a guarantee of much. It is not a guarantee that you will be immune from, from suffering, from that you will have physical health and mental health and prosperity at all times in all situations. Because if it was, why wouldn't Jesus tap into that? Why wouldn't Jesus, somebody who ultimately gave up his very life for the whole of humanity, tap in to that abundance. He, he had situations where he had to live in poverty, he had situations where he didn't have anywhere to lay his head. There are too many of us that try and use God as a spiritual slot machine. Mm. You just put the coin in and you wait. Mm. Yeah. Ooh, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I want to say is that in order to tap into that promise of abundance, it is important to honor the Lord with your first fruits and to have a fundamental understanding, fundamental understanding of what that means. And so if there's any of you that need to correct that today, this is a good time to need to take that first step. Thank you. I can see me sitting down and not preaching at some point because we have people to take over from us. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> So yeah, the, the details are there for you to give, and I'm just going to pray over the giving, and then we'll do the uh, Holy Communion, and then we'll bring service to a close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us to, to give. For all those who have given, and for those who desire to give, whether they have or not, let us all be blessed by this our obedience in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father Lord, give us the heart to follow you, Lord, so yeah. that we may tap into the abundance that you've promised us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Now we're going to take the only communion. For those who uh, may have had all sorts concerning this, I do not blame you. History has, has been reviewed with all sorts concerning 
the Holy Communion. So let me just make it clear that these are symbolic things tapping into spiritual truth. You understand? What we are eating here is not the body of Jesus, but it represents the body of Jesus. This is not the blood of Jesus. It just represents the blood that you shed. The real power is in your faith as you do it. Jesus asks us to do it. That is why we're doing it. He says, as often as we can, we should do it. So if you believe you have committed any sin, please ask God for forgiveness before you partake of this so that you don't eat it without wisdom. But we eat this waver that represents his body by faith, knowing fully whether his body was broken so that our body may be made whole. Eat it by faith in Jesus' name. From the crown of our heads to the source of our feet, disease has no right to be in it because Jesus has already paid for it. Our mind, we have the mind of Christ so we do not suffer any mental issue. Father, Lord, we thank you. We give you all the glory. As we drink this, this represents the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary. This was the day we were set free. We are not guilty because it has been paid for. And so Satan has no right in our lives. Past, present, and future. Drink it in the name of Jesus. Every Father, we thank you for what our Lord Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross of Calvary. Amen. We tap you to it into our lives. Father Lord, we cannot do anything without your help. Help us, Father Lord. Amen. In everywhere where we need help, help us, Lord. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen. I pray that you have an amazing week ahead of you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I pray that God will have gone ahead of each and every one of us in the name of Jesus. Amen. We will have testimonies to give unto our Lord at the end of the week. Everything we hear, our hands on shall prosper. Amen. Everything that confronts us shall be dispelled. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen. amen, amen, and amen. You don't want to miss the Bible study. Wednesday, 7 p.m., you get an opportunity to ask questions and it is interactive. And you get an opportunity to contribute as well. God bless you and bye for now. Bye. Woo.